This is the Coford Books AuthorCast. I'm your host, Brian Whitney. Charles Harrell is an associate professor in Brigham Young University's School of Technology, where he is the graduate coordinator for the Manufacturing Systems Program. In addition to teaching and advising students, he recently led a humanitarian project to build electricity-generating playground equipment in Ghana. In addition to his professional activities, Charles is an ardent theological hobbyist and has published articles on Mormon theology in BYU Studies, the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, and Studies in the Scriptures. In This is My Doctrine, the Development of Mormon Theology, Charles makes the case that the principal doctrines defining Mormonism today often bear little resemblance to those it started out with in the early 1830s. Charles shows that Mormon doctrines did not originate in a vacuum, but were rather prompted and informed by the religious culture from which it arose. Early Mormons, like their early Christian and even earlier Israelite predecessors, brought with them their own varied and culturally conditioned theological presuppositions, and only later acquired a more distinctive theological outlook. This comprehensive treatment of the development of Mormon theology traces the history of Latter-day Saint doctrines from the times of the Old Testament to the present, and describes how Mormonism has carried on the tradition of the biblical authors, early Christians, and later Protestants, in reinterpreting scripture to accommodate new theological ideas while attempting to uphold the integrity and the authority of the scriptures. In this episode, we interview Charles Harrell. Charles Harrell, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit about your background before we start talking about This Is My Doctor. Okay. Um, I grew up in Indiana, where my family joined the church when I was five. I served a mission to Mexico. I got my bachelor's degree from BYU, my master's from the University of Utah, and a PhD in manufacturing engineering from the Technical University of Denmark. I worked in industry for six years before accepting a teaching position at BYU in the School of Technology, and there I've spent the last 33 years. Uh, Along the way, I founded a software company that develops and sells software for improving business processes and military operations. Religiously, I've had a lifelong fascination with Mormon doctrine and how we as Mormons interpret, or I should say misinterpret, scripture. Growing up, I believed that the truths of eternity were to be found in the scriptures and teachings of the prophets, so that was where I focused my uh, gospel study. When I attended BYU, I read just about every LDS publication I could find in the BYU library, including uh, the multi-volume History of the Church, the Journal of Discourses, all the conference talks up to the present time. Uh, All the while, I took uh, notes on everything that had doctrinal significance, and uh, I would assemble the notes and study them. And as I started assembling the pieces of the puzzle of Mormon theology, I discovered that some of the pieces didn't seem to fit so well, and that some pieces even seemed a little contrived in order to make them fit. I also discovered competing puzzle pieces, seemingly intended to fill the same holes, but in different ways. I struggled with how to make sense out of the doctrinal changes and inconsistencies I was discovering, but it wasn't really until I began to place doctrinal teachings in their historical timeline and examine them chronologically that things really started to make sense. That's when I started to realize that doctrine has a history and that it develops over time not necessarily consistently, and not always in a simple line-upon-line unfolding. And this is what got me thinking about writing a book on this phenomenon. Now, when you discovered some of these inconsistencies and changes over time, how did that strike you initially? Well, initially I went through all the different mental gymnastics that uh, most students of the gospel go through when delving into Mormon doctrine. Uh, I look for ways to make teachings harmonize with one another, I uh, tried to use the scriptures as a standard, but uh, discovered there were even inconsistencies in the scriptures. One technique uh, that helped resolve a lot of the cognitive dissonance uh, 
was simply privileging the teachings of the most recent prophets um, over the dead prophets. So it's sort of the living prophets trumping the dead prophets. Uh, When teachings were too incredulous or perplexing, uh, simply uh, place them on the proverbial shelf. And uh, after playing these doctrinal mind games for some time, I finally came to the uh, realization that doctrine, or at least our understanding of doctrine, simply changes over time. Uh, that's not a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just uh, the reality of the matter. And these changes can result from a number of different factors. Uh, scientific discoveries, new historical information, changing cultural, social norms. The upshot of all this was a recognition of the evolutionary nature of doctrinal development and the human shaping of doctrine. Doctrines, uh, it occurred to me, don't just fall out of heaven in the form of absolute truths. Uh, They seem to develop through human interaction with texts and ideas that are in the air. Now that doesn't mean that doctrinal development is not unaided by revelation, only that uh, there's a strong human component involved. Before you embarked on this adventure uh, in learning about the doctrine and the the development of doctrine, rather, uh, who were, were you reading? I was primarily reading the works of the leaders of the church, going all the way back to Joseph Smith. My appetite for Mormon theology uh, caused me to read all the doctrinal sermons of church leaders I could get my hands on, and I spent as much time as I could poring over the teachings of the prophets, particularly the prophet Joseph Smith. My belief at the time was that these were the individuals closest to the source of truth, so who better to read than the prophets? I was operating under an assumption that there was a systematic theology in Mormonism, and I wanted to understand it. Uh, This would have been the time when I was in my 20s and still had a fairly fundamentalist assumption about Mormon theology, uh, supposing it to be uniformly consistent and without error. Uh, So mostly you stuck with general authorities, it sounds like. That was true for the most part, uh, because to me, um, they were the oracles of God who could give me, or at least help me understand, the truths of the eternity that I was seeking. Okay. And uh, did you read anybody outside of general authorities, Hugh Nibley, any of of the other writers? Oh, yes. I was a voracious reader, so my appetite for doctrinal understanding went well beyond the writings and sermons of uh, general authorities. One of my early favorites was Hiram Andrus, uh, as well as other noted BYU Mormon scholars who wrote either doctrinal or scriptural commentaries. Those were the things I was most interested in reading. And uh, I need to mention that these were all writers, by the way, who expounded LDS doctrine, not writers who objectively critiqued or scrutinized LDS doctrine. So what were some of the, uh, you think, assumptions? I mean, you've kind of covered it, but what were some of the assumptions that you quickly had to start contending with as you, uh, as, as you started working through this paradigm shift? Well, there were two related assumptions that were particularly challenging during my research, and that was scriptural inerrancy and scriptural uniformity. I came to realize that these were actually fundamentalist assumptions that Mormons had adopted from Christian tradition, but they weren't really supported by most credible biblical scholars. As I started reading more articles from Dialogue and Sunstone, I began to realize that these assumptions didn't even hold for modern LDS scriptures. What made these assumptions of scriptural inerrancy and doctrinal uniformity especially difficult to abandon was the fact that scripture itself assumes scriptural inerrancy and uniformity. This meant that I had to take these passages themselves as reflecting the theological presuppositions of the writers. I remember resisting giving way to allowing for scriptural error for scriptural error because uh, these passages were bearing witness to the truth of the teachings they contained. So what I was forced to choose between was the self-testimony of scripture and the evidence of error and change that exist in the scriptures themselves. This was a tough tension to deal with. Ultimately, I came to the conclusion that the self-testimony of scripture uh, is itself part of the religious paradigm of the scriptural writers. 
This newfound awareness of Scripture led to another major assumption that crumbled for me, and that is prophetic infallibility. Now, sure, I accepted, as many LDS do, that prophets were not strictly fallible, especially when it comes to inconsequential matters, but I resisted letting go of the idea that they could err on major, fundamental Mormon doctrines. I felt certain that God would not leave us in the dark or confused about the most fundamental truths of the gospel. But once I discovered that uh, even the most basic doctrine of the church are also on uh, tenuous, uh, shaky grounding, it caused me to rethink my entire LDS paradigm, including my perception of what constitutes a prophet. I no longer viewed a prophet as someone who merely transmits God's eternal truths to humankind, but rather as someone who, however inspired he might be, is still situated in a specific time, a specific culture, and is bound by the limits imposed by history and culture. This led me to uh, the conclusion that the teachings of the prophets, including those contained in the standard works of the church, are not infallible, and that they reflect the historical consciousness, uh, the, the cultural sensibilities of the time. Rather than being God's response to man, they were seeming to me to be more man's response to God. Now this doesn't say or doesn't suggest that I reject the inspiration of prophets. I just don't see compelling evidence that inspiration necessarily equates to consistent and inerrant teachings. How long did you work on This Is My Doctrine? Well, I had been dabbling in the idea for probably over 30 years. Uh, In the early 1980s, I wrote an article for BYU Studies on the development of the doctrine of preexistence in early Mormonism and discovered at that time that the doctrine had gone through four or five major formulations before we got our current idea of uh, premortal spirit birth. I began entertaining the idea that if this doctrine had undergone such change, dramatic change, there may be other interesting uh, uh, historical developments for other doctrines as well. Uh, I'd have to say that I actually began the book project in earnest probably about 15 or 20 years ago. One of the aspects of the book that made it take so long is that I wanted to expand the exploration of Mormon doctrine Uh, or doctrinal development beyond just the development that occurred since the beginning of the Restoration. I wanted to explore how similar doctrines developed in Old Testament and New Testament times as well as in early 19th century religious movements which may have had an influence on Mormon thought. Uh, Then I traced how doctrines were taught in the earliest days of the Church including in the Book of Mormon Uh, then how they mutated during the Kirtland period and on through the Nauvoo era. Finally, uh, I look at uh, how they might have been tweaked up until the current day. Most of the focus is on doctrinal change occurring during the lifetime of Joseph Smith, since that was probably the most formative period of LDS doctrinal development. Can you think of anything that was uh, kind of a big surprise for you as you're going through this? Several things. Uh, I was surprised at the fact that the most distinctive LDS doctrines like spirit birth, uh, the nature of the Godhead, three degrees of glory, temple ordinances, uh, particularly eternal marriage, salvation for the dead, the concept of a lay priesthood, and probably I'm missing others. uh, All these seem to be not only missing from the Book of Mormon, but many cases are contradicted in the Book of Mormon. I was also surprised uh, by how closely Book of Mormon theology maps to the teachings of early 19th century restorationist and uh, evangelical movements. I believe probably the greatest surprise was at how little biblical grounding there is for most distinctive Mormon doctrines, including the apostasy, the restoration of the gospel itself, Uh, Biblical passages we routinely cite as evidence for Mormon doctrine seem to be taken out of context and or have other reference. Familiar examples uh, include the seal book in Isaiah 29, uh, the stick of Joseph in Ezekiel 37, terrestrial and celestial bodies spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, the flying 
angel in the midst of heaven in Revelation 14. I think we lose respectability and certainly credibility when we carelessly employ biblical proof text to bolster our beliefs. I think we're better off embracing Mormon doctrines based on their own merits and our belief in modern revelation uh, and for their own sake, not whether or not they're supported by biblical texts. Speaking of the uh, scarcity of uh, biblical support for Mormonism, I was particularly surprised to learn how little support there is for Christianity itself. While Christians see hundreds of references, for example, to Christ and his atonement in the Old Testament, I was astonished to find that modern biblical scholarship sees virtually no references at all. This isn't to say that Christianity wasn't a natural outgrowth of the Second Temple uh, period, but it certainly doesn't seem to have been contemplated by Old Testament prophets. Beginning on Black Friday and running through Cyber Monday, Greg Coford Books is pleased to offer 30% off all Book of Mormon related titles and 40% off the complete six volume set of Brant Gardner's Second Witness Commentary Series, limited to the first 100 sets. The Book of Mormon will be the Gospel Doctrine focus for 2016, so be sure to take advantage of this Black Friday weekend sale for your personal study or for the teacher or student of Scripture in your life. Visit GregCofordBooks.com for more information about this weekend's Black Friday sale. So what I'd like you to do, if if you can, is to give us a couple of concrete examples of uh, perhaps an LDS-specific doctrine uh, that uh, and kind of walk us through some of the changes that you've seen over time. Sure. Um, a simple yet significant example that we alluded to earlier is the doctrine of premortal spirit birth. It's interesting that in the Old Testament there isn't any notion of the pre-existence of the soul, much less spirit birth. When God creates Adam and Eve, he breathes into them the breath of life, and man goes on living as long as he breathes, and when he dies, he uh, breath leaves him. So, uh, in the Old Testament, though, we have several passages that are often cited in church manuals today to support premortal spirit birth, but according to biblical scholars, these have other meanings. For example, when God asked Job where he was when the foundations of the earth were laid and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God is actually rhetorically implying that Job was nowhere around. The sons of God referred to are members of uh, God's divine court, They're not pre-existent offspring of God. So this reference in Job really has no reference to uh, premortal spirit birth. The New Testament uh, similarly contains little notion of the idea of pre-existence except for in the case of Jesus. The Gospel of John, in fact, uses that as one of the distinguishing characteristics between Jesus and everyone else. In testifying of Christ's pre-existence, John the Baptist, who is six months older than Christ, said, He existed before I was born. That's the Phillips version. So John alludes twice to Christ's uniqueness in coming down from heaven in contrast to man who originated on earth. So like the Old Testament, the New Testament gives little support for premortal spirit birth since it has little sense of premortality itself. But in spite of this fact, we have adopted several pet New Testament passages to support spirit birth all of which, according to most New Testament scholars, are either taken out of context or they're simply misread. Let's look, for example, at uh, Paul's allusion in Acts 17 to a Greek poem expressing the idea that we're God's offspring. Uh, Paul's appealing to this Greek myth that the race of men originated with the gods to convince the Athenians that they shouldn't think of God as some inanimate object like metal or stone. He makes no mention, though, of pre-existence, nor does he suggest that we are spiritual offspring of God. As we turn to uh, some other teachings contemporaneous with Joseph Smith, uh, it's interesting to note that it was common for Christians to speak of God as their father, but only in the sense of being the creator of heaven and earth and all things therein. This was also the way God is spoken of as our father in the earliest LDS scriptures and writings. The Book of Mormon, for example, uh, talks about God as the father of heaven and earth, but uh, gives little inkling of preexistence and never speaks of humans as being the spirit offspring of God. 
The first clear reference to preexistence occurs in 1830 in the Book of Moses and in the early revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants which speak of spirits being created. Uh, it's interesting that it uses the, the term creation and not begotten. In fact, uh, it even speaks of Christ as being the creator of man's spirit, which would preclude being spiritually born of God the Father. The early LDS concept of a spiritual creation echoes contemporary fringe teachings, which also speak of the first creation story in Genesis as being a spiritual creation. DNC 93 uh, which was given in 1833, is really the first allusion to the idea that the spirit of man is derived from eternal, uncreated intelligence, which is the same intelligence or light of truth that constitutes God's glory. This gave rise to speculations that the human spirit was the product of divine emanation, that spirits were not the offspring of God, but rather the offshoot of God. It uh, was in 1839, I believe, that Joseph Smith first began advancing a doctrine of eternally existing intelligences, and this, in fact, continued to be his teaching throughout the remainder of his sermons and writings. He taught that in the beginning, God came down in the midst of eternally existing spirits or intelligences and provided a plan for them to receive physical bodies. So, oddly, there's no contemporary record of Joseph Smith ever teaching premortal spirit birth, just as there is no contemporary record of him teaching that we had a heavenly mother. Later second and third hand accounts of Smith teaching these doctrines uh, are not entirely reliable. The doctrine of spirit birth um, first appears in Orson Pratt's Prophetic Almanac, published in August 1844. And then do you see it continue to develop beyond Orson Pratt? Or, Orson Pratt certainly got the ball rolling. Uh, throughout 1845, it became a topic of immense fascination, uh, culminating in Eliza R. Snow's poem, Oh My Father, published in October 1845. So by 1845, all the basic elements we embrace today were in place. However, its convoluted past involving physical creationism, premortal spirit creationism, divine emanation, uh, uncreated self-existing spirits have challenged later LDS doctrinal expositors who felt the need to harmonize all of these disparate teachings. Aside from the basic teaching taught by Pratt and embraced today that we are spirit children of heavenly parents, what I have seen occur at different times in the church is speculation about the role plural marriage plays in God's own marriage. There have also been repeated speculations as to why we don't hear anything about our Heavenly Mother or mothers. This question was again raised with the New Gospel Topics essay on our Heavenly Mother. One potentially major jolt to the doctrine of spirit birth came recently when BYU Studies published an article by Sam Brown challenging the traditional notion of a literal or procreative spirit birth. Brown suggested that Joseph Smith's final teachings point to more of a covenantal or adoptive father-son relationship between God and premortal spirits, sort of the way we become adopted children of Christ through the gospel. This interpretation um, of the record certainly has an appeal, a certain appeal to it, but it does raise uh, some questions. In wrapping up, uh, what do you hope that your readers will come away with from reading this book? I think I'd have to say that my primary goal was merely to share information that I found along my own pathway to understanding Mormon theology that I thought might be of interest to others who uh, find themselves on a similar journey. I think of it as the kind of book I wish I could have read as I was beginning to challenge my own basic understanding about Mormon theology. What I hope readers come away with, then, is a greater appreciation for the way Mormon doctrines developed and perhaps a recognition of the finite and fallible shaping of these doctrines. I'm kind of reminded of the end of the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where Indiana's father had made it his lifelong quest to find the Holy Grail. And just as Indiana and his father get their hopes up at obtaining the Grail, it slips through their hands for good. <laughs> 
Indiana later asked his father what he felt he gained from his lifelong search for the grail, and in response his father, played by Sean Connery, simply stated, Illumination. I think many of us discover in our lifelong search to find the holy grail of unerring truth that it is also elusive and always just out of reach. So what I state at the end of the book is that I empathize with fellow grail seekers who also find that the holy grail of religious truth and certainty is ever elusive and ultimately unobtainable. But I hope it does give one illumination about the nature of the quest itself and how humankind has responded to call to search for ultimate truth. This illumination regarding the rough and tumbling road of theological discovery causes one, I think, to be more humble and sympathetic to the faith quests of others. For me personally, I think I've become more tolerant and hopefully more appreciative of the diversity of religious beliefs found in the world today. Uh, It's instilled in me a bit of what Christer Stendhal calls holy envy, uh, that... um, feeling of appreciation for other faith traditions that I think is sorely lacking in the church and certainly was in my early days in the church. Charles, we really appreciate your time and we appreciate the hard work that you've put into uh, This Is My Doctor and it's a fantastic book. Well, thank you, Brian. That was Charles Harrell, author of This Is My Doctor, The Development of Mormon Theology, available in hardcover and ebook from Greg Coford Books. Thank you for listening to the Coford Books AuthorCasts. Be sure to subscribe and rate our podcast in iTunes, and like us on Facebook to receive the latest news about our authors and releases.